Good morning, everybody. Those of you who don't know me, my name's Rick. I'm the lead pastor here. Um, if you've got a Bible, you can turn in it to the book of Ecclesiastes. Just two more times. Two more times. Um, hey, I have actually, I've noticed a number of you uh, who are unfamiliar to me. I mean, it's probably it's either your first Sunday or something similar. Uh, you know, almost every week is somebody's first Sunday here at UPC, and we are really glad that you're here. Um, for, for you and for everybody else uh, who, who may not be aware, there's, there's an, a handout or an insert in your bulletin that's entitled Life Groups. And I want to just draw a little bit of attention to that because most of us, when we're looking for church, our worship experience is part of that. Like we, you know, we, it's what, we're going to church, right? But then a lot of what we're looking for a church to be for us, community, relationships, connection, all of that stuff, that's hard to find in a room like this, as big as it is with all these people. That's what our life groups are for. These are smaller groups, you know, 8 to 12, sometimes a little bigger than that, generally not much bigger than that, who gather throughout the week to help one another just live life, grow together, help us help one another follow Jesus. Um, there, are, there are a number of those listed. These aren't all of our groups. These are the groups that have, have space in our, uh, that, that's kind of on the, on the back there. We've listed them according to generalized area. We'd love for you to take a look at that. If you're interested, you can contact those folks. Don't be surprised if you're a member or regular attender here, if you're not in a group, to have someone contact you. Um, and that's not, we're not, not trying to bug you, but what's going to happen is our leaders are, are we, we want everyone in our church to be in that kind of community. Um, and, and if like a, a life group isn't your thing, there are also, there's going to be three women's uh, Bible study groups, um, and there's three men's groups in the fall as well. Uh, I think we have, we had some information about those last week. There'll be more information. Find a place to connect um, so that you can, you can do life with other people and you can help one another grow in, with Jesus. Okay. All right. As I said a second ago, we are in the last two weeks of this series in Ecclesiastes that we've called Meaningless. Um, And so the series, not the time, uh, right? The series is meaningless, not necessarily the the time. Um, And and this week is the last of our kind of writer's perspectives on on his project. And by that, what I mean is we've we've made the argument that this book is is a thought experiment. A thought experiment trying to take what we normally do in life as it is and and run it to its logical conclusion. And what I mean by that is to try and take something, something apart from a personal ultimate God and say, I want to place my hopes in that and not in that God, right? And maybe that thing is, you know, Vic mentioned a bunch of them. Maybe it's work, maybe it's money, maybe it's pleasure, maybe it's relationships and acceptance. But we want to find something, something that we can be independent in and, and apart from him and find uh, our hopes placed in that thing. And over and over and over again, what we've seen is that when we do that, we make those things meaningless, which doesn't mean pointless. It means unable to hold the weight. It means uh, vaporous or, or it just it can't deliver, right? Last week, we looked at youth, found that it can't deliver on its promises because it doesn't last. And this week, we look at its corollary age. Of course, none of us are dealing with, right? And so this morning, um, if you've got your place, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let's stand in honor of God's word. I'll be reading verses 1 to 8 in chapter 12. They're projected on the wings in case you want to follow along that way. This is God's word to us. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. And the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent, the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. The doors on the street are shut. When the sound of grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, 
and desire fails. Because man is going to his eternal home when the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, give us ears to hear this morning. Um, Ears to hear not from me, but from you. We are all in need of the gospel, whether for the first time or for the first time in the last 10 minutes. We need it. We need you to preach it. And Holy Spirit, we need you to, to give us the faith to believe it. So we ask that you do that. Don't let us leave here without being changed. We need you. So we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Have a seat. Six months. That's how long we've been walking through this cheery, upbeat, optimistic piece of literature. If you've been here for that time or just most of it, you may have noticed that there is a shadow that sits over everything that our teacher has said. Everything, no matter the topic, there's this shadow that kind of sits over it. If this book is about seeking something apart from God to hold our hopes, to hold your hopes, to hold my hopes, there is one reality that kind of ominously sits in the background that we can't escape. A reality that decimates every potential option that that our teacher investigates, and that is death. That is the reality, the one thing that in an absolute way makes everything else meaningless. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Are you excited? So cheery. All right, here we go. As always, there's an outline. If you like to take notes, if not, leave it. Don't worry about it. Um, but if you're new to Presbyterianism, that's how we amen, okay? We take notes. We go, mm. Sometimes we nudge. You can amen, though. That would be great. All right, anyway, let's, let's dig into this. All right, so this passage is highly metaphorical, which is to say it uses lots of word pictures. If you, were, if you noticed that, if you were uh, listening to this and you were thinking to yourself, I have no idea what this is talking about, that's why. Because it uses lots of word pictures, pictures that we're going to get into. And the first thing that it's trying to deal with is the opposite of what we looked at last, last week, right? And it's the coming of age, Okay, look down at verses 1 and 2. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. Love this, okay? So one way of taking this, one way that you could take this, is that this is kind of the words of an older dude who's looking at younger people and saying, make your peace with God while you're young, okay? You could, you could see it that way. The problem with that is that the rest of this passage doesn't really speak to any kind of hope, <laughs> that that would happen, uh, or that you should actually do that. Instead, what's going on is slightly different, okay? Remember, again, this book is written from the perspective of someone from a, interestingly enough, for those of you who, who may be new to this, interestingly enough, it's written from a deeply secular perspective. It's written from a perspective of trying to figure out a way apart from God, apart from him, trying to avoid an, a, a personal ultimate God. How can we do that? And so what he's getting at, per se, when he says to make peace with your creator in the days of your youth is not God per se, but your creator. In other words, he's trying to get across the fact that you and I have one and it's not us, right? That we have a creator. Over and over again in this book, the teacher has been, has been trying to seek independence, trying to seek a way to assert himself, to, to, to kind of climb up this ladder and, and through some means find a way to be independent. But in the end, he finds himself still coming to the conclusion that he is not independent, that he is not self-determining, but he has a creator. I I think we take that for granted, Christian or not, we take that for granted. Because when you create something, that generally means you have rights over it, yes? Right? We we do that today, right? You have have things called, uh, if if you work in the world of the mind, you have intellectual property, right? You create it, it's yours. You can determine what you do with it. Right? We, we, we have lots of things where if we create it, it's ours. And so the idea that we have a creator means that I don't belong to me. I belong to someone else. And his point is simply this. 
You and I need to come to grips with this before age begins to take over. And that's where he goes in verses three to five with the house that closes. Look there now. So these verses are beautiful art. And here's why. On the literal level, you could look at all of these and you could, you could see these as um, kind of what's being talked about is the closing of a very large house, right? Some scholars, some Old Testament scholars would go so far as to say that what's being talked about here is kind of the, what, what happens is a funeral is processing by. But here's the thing though. Some of those, these things make absolutely no sense when you take them literally, Okay. In other words, why would the, the, those that grind, that would con- be considered like grinding flour, why, why would you grind less? Like, why would you stop working if there's less of you? It actually means you would have to work more. But all of these things can be taken figuratively to speak of what happens when you and I age. Follow me, okay? Trembling. I think that goes without saying, Right? That thing that tends to happen when, with the arms and the hands as we start to get older, being bent, something that can certainly be, can be said of the knees that aren't working right, or the back that often can happen as we weaken. The grinders that are few might be a little harder for us to get with with our modern dental work, but those are teeth, right? Remember, this is the ancient world. You didn't go for your every six-month cleaning two-year cleaning, whatever it is for you, right? Didn't have dentures. The dimming of those behind the windows would speak with difficulties in memory. And then, of course, we have in verse 4, the sleeplessness, right? You awaken at the sound of a bird. No one of us have that problem, right? We sleep soundly all night long. Never any problems of getting up in the middle of the night. And probably you have hearing loss at the end of verse 4. Verse 5 speaks to fearing of heights, which, you know, uh, I, I know that, that that happens as we get older because of fear of falling. The only older person I've ever known who seemed to defy this was um, a guy in my last church by the name of Carlton Laundry, who still at the age of 90 was climbing ladders and trimming trees with his chainsaw. Uh, he's fearless, fearless. The only one I knew, okay? It happens. The blossoms of the almond tree, which are white. I don't know if you knew that. The blossoms of the almond tree are white. Probably speaking of the inevitable change in hair color. Grasshopper dragging itself along. Don't think we have to talk about that. And then we have this talk of desire. When we talk about desire, we need to be clear what this is talking about. Probably because a lot of us don't think the Bible talks about this. But that word that we translate desire, it's actually a little bit of a gloss. And what I mean by that is it's not exactly what the word means. In the original, which is Hebrew, the, in the Hebrew, it, the word that's used there is um, the word for a caper berry. I don't know how many of us uh, really love the caper berry. I'd never heard of it myself. But apparently in that part of the world, it was used as an aphrodisiac. So he's talking about desire failing. What he means is the aphrodisiac no longer works. And then he says these days are evil. It makes sense, right? Desire is failing. It's not working, right? In a highly poetic way, our teacher is explaining the ravages of age using the image of a funeral procession passing a house. And clearly, he's not viewing it as positive, right? These are, he says, evil days, full of terrors and failure and weakness. Which is to say, if youth didn't satisfy, if youth couldn't deliver on our hopes, then certainly age isn't going to, right? And that brings us to the end of the procession. Look at verse 6. He says, the silver cord is snapped, the golden bowl is broken. Now, two things to note about this. First is, these are items of value. I mean, I think that we should easily see that. Silver and gold, it wasn't very very common in the ancient world. Um, You couldn't go to Target and get a silver pair of earrings, right? They didn't have that. So, um, So the first is that they are items of value. Now, when he says silver cord, some of you who are geeks like me will think that he's talking about some Greek notion because the Greeks had this idea of the fates, Right? And the fates had this little silver cord and you cut it. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Um, Percy Jackson. Okay, how about that? Yeah, okay, a couple of you get it. All right, so the, the fates, the, the Greeks had this idea that everyone had this silver cord that was their life. And it would cut. that's not what this is talking about. Okay, the Hebrews, Hebrew uh, culture had no such story. He's speaking literally of a rope made out of silver. And the same is true of a golden bowl. What he's envisioning is something immensely valuable coming to an end. 
Okay? And the second thing to note is just that, that it is about destruction. Okay? And, and just so we're clear on that, when he's talking about using these, he does that using these water metaphors. The pitcher at the fountain, that is what you use to draw water out. The wheel at the cistern is what you use, again, to pull water out. And when you live in a desert, that has to do with life. It's not just, oh, I, I like a glass of ice water. It's I'm going to die if I don't drink this. So in both cases, that is something that is life-giving, and it is destroyed. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, we need to understand that in the story of the Bible, life matters. It matters. I said last week, but let me make it more explicit. In the story of Scripture, God created all things, and he called them good. That means that God intended for matter to exist. And what I mean, when I say matter, I need to be very clear. I mean this matter that you and I hate every morning. This matter that we argue about and complain at when we can't get out of bed. And it's like creaking and everything's not working right. Young guys, you'll, you'll get it. It'll come. This stuff with the aches and the pains that God called it good, very good, in fact. And this is important for us to understand because we tend to think that God deals in the spiritual. And by that, we mean the non-material. Some of us have even been convinced that that's what it is to be Christian. It is not. That is the religion of Yoda, not of Jesus. Right? It's Yoda that said we're luminous beings, not crude matter. Jesus never said that. The Bible doesn't speak like that. The story of Scripture is that God makes everything and he spends particular time and attention on one aspect of creation, humanity. One particular aspect. So at the high point of the story in in the book of Genesis, God creates all things and then he pauses. He's like going like wildfire. He's like, let this happen, let this happen, let this happen, let this happen. Then he pauses. He says, let us make man in our image. Okay? And then... Whereas with everything else, he just said, let it be, and it happened. With, with this particular aspect of humanity, God gets his hands in the mud. And he forms a man out of dirt. And then he <sighs> breathes life into him. Like it's, it's, it's striking in the, in the book of Genesis how utterly distinct this is from everything else. Let there be light, boom, light. Let there be trees, boom, trees. Let there be animals to fill all these spheres that I've made, boom. Hmm, man, give me a minute. Forming, shaping, making the fingers, breathe life in. Here's how this all ties in. You and I were made for life. We were made for life. We are incredibly valuable. The only aspect of all of creation that is said to be made in God's image is us. Right? Man, woman, doesn't matter your, your gender, your, your, your ethnicity, doesn't, doesn't matter your ability. Made in God's image. You and I were made for life. And when death happens, when life frees, flees from that body, something incredibly valuable has been lost. Humanity, we were created to be a union between body and soul. Right? If you're a theology nerd, the, the technical term for that is a psychosomatic unity. Oh, that's a wonderful little word. You can use it. People think you're smart. Uh, it, it means that we are made to be united, body and soul. And when death happens, it dissolves that unity. And this reality is brought forward in these last two verses. Look down at verses 70. He says, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. This is the exact opposite of what we find in the creation account, right? Genesis 2-7. You can look there later. Genesis 2-7 is the exact opposite. God makes the body, breathes life into it, breathes the spirit into it. But here, dust returns to the earth, the spirit returns to God. This is completely the opposite. Now, I need to be clear. When it says that the spirit returns to the God who gave it, this is not meant to be a theology of the afterlife. Okay? It's not what this is meant to be. Many of us have been taught... Uh, taught to believe, or at least we believe by default, that when you die, right? Again, going back to Yoda, when you die, what is most true of us leaves and goes to be with God. And then what the shell that remains behind, right? 
Come on, we, we know that. we've been taught this. We believe this. Sometimes we comfort ourselves with it. But what the teacher here is saying is not, here's what happens when you die, right? That wouldn't square with the rest of the passage or the rest of the book. What he's saying is that death undoes creation. In creation, God brought body and soul together in his image, and death reverses that. Death is not a part of life. It is not meant to be here. It is an an invader. It is an invader that has held sway for thousands of years, but it is not meant to be here. It undoes the work of God. We were made for life. Life found in a dependent relationship with God. And what this means is that we were made to depend on him, depend on him for for everything, for breath, for meaning, for our understanding of reality, for our identity, to know good from evil, for everything. He lovingly provided for us and we lovingly depended on him. That's the way it worked. But in time, we were tricked into believing a lie. The content of that lie was less insidious than the the assumptions behind it, namely that we couldn't trust him. Can't trust him. He's not out for us. He's going to use his power against us. He's he's holding us back. And so we believed that lie and betrayed God by doing the one thing he told us not to do. You see, the actual content of the lie that we find in Genesis 3 is that if you eat a fruit... Right? If you eat the, from this one tree that God said not to, that we would become like God and be able to define reality for ourselves. Now, here's the funny thing. God never said that. Right? God never said that's what happens if you eat the fruit. That's what the snake said. What God did say is that when you eat the fruit, right? if you break relationship with me, if you seek independence from me, that that's going to lead to death. That's the very thing the snake said, oh, that won't happen. Instead, this is going to happen. But that's actually exactly what did happen. We betrayed God, which is what the Bible calls sin, right? It's not, not so much about breaking rules as it is breaking relationship. It's, it's, it's betrayal. And when we did that, we became betrayers. And what sin does Right? I know some of us are uncomfortable with that word. Just follow me, okay? But what sin does is it, it separates things. It divides them. And you see that in Genesis 3. It, it, it divides our relationship with God. Boom. There's now this, we, we're afraid of him. Like when, when he comes walking in the garden, humanity is afraid of him. It, it divides our relationship with each other. When God calls us to account, what does is, what is Adam do? He, he throws his wife in front of God says, it's her fault, right? Like it, we, it's division with one another. Ultimately, it even divides body and soul in death. Death is not a part of life. It is the consequence of seeking life independent of God. It's part of our guilt. And it's it's utmost part being the, the spiritual death that the Bible calls hell. But here's the thing, though. The problem isn't just guilt. That's bad, but it's not just that. Something else happened. See, in, in the Bible, sin isn't just what we do. If sin were just what we do, then it would be really easy for us to point fingers, wouldn't it? As a matter of fact, that's some of the reason why some of us are really good at pointing fingers. Because we've mistaken that. But it's not just what we do. It's who we are. It's a state that we entered into. By nature, we are now stuck believing that lie, living out of that. In other words, independence from God is now our default. It's, it's a feature, not a bug. Right? It's, part of the pro- it's part of who we are. We sin because we're sinners. Right? Jesus said this. He said that bad fruit doesn't come from good trees. Good fruit doesn't come from bad trees. And he said, it's out of, actually, it's out of the heart that all of these wicked things that we keep struggling with, it's out of our heart that things, that they come. Isn't that we become sinners when we sin? It's that we sin b- because by nature we are sinners. Which means that we are stuck. We are stuck under the power of death. And that is why our teacher ends the book the same way he began it. That's why he ends it with vanity of vanity, meaninglessness of meaninglessness. Everything is meaningless because we're stuck. Death is inevitable because we cannot, cannot fix what caused it. We cannot fix our betrayal of God. If we are to be set free from meaninglessness, set free from death, then we will need to be rescued from the sin that caused it. And that is something that you and I cannot do on our own. Now, let me try and speak in a more applied manner if I can. I love that this kind of ends here. 
If you were here at the very beginning, which I don't anticipate everyone was, but if you were here at the very beginning, we talked about the fact that the book of Ecclesiastes is a frame, or it's set within a frame. The frame, the first few verses, and the, and the frame that we'll get to next week, the end of the matter. And within it is this thought project. And so that it's kind of this week is kind of the end of the reflections of this project. And I love that it ends here because this really is the ultimate nullifier of any attempt to find something to hold our hopes. This is our 24th sermon in this series. And I know, listen, I know that can be wearying because it's the, the entire point of this book is deconstruction. It is meant to take the things that you and I chase after without even thinking about it. We don't even know we're doing it half the time. And we chase after it and it's meant to look at it and look at us and go, okay, you, you think that's gonna help you? Let me, let me deconstruct that for you. Let me show you why that can't hold the weight of your hopes. It's meant to look at those places that we are so confident that we can find status in or security in or satisfaction in and it exposes them as lies. Do you see? Like, even if money could make you somebody, you die. Right? Even, even if, even if pleasure could give you satisfaction, it ends and you die. And even if knowledge could keep you safe from everything else, can't keep death away. Eventually, we will grow old and we will die. Death is undefeated. Well, nearly. And that's where Jesus comes in. You see, unlike those that were reading this the first time, we live on the other side of the cross. We live in an era where not just we've had something deconstructed for us, but we've had the other side of it come into play where where now it's not just that we're disrupted from the places that we've, we've placed our hopes, but we're enticed towards something so much better. We, we get to see how God actually worked to rescue us. Because so many of us tend, like, like, listen, so many of us tend to believe that Jesus did all the miracles that he did, right? To prove that he was God. I know. Uh, and listen, I was nurtured and nursed in college ministry. And that, that was kind of the way things were, uh, we, that we described things or, or, or talked about them like, but, it, but it's not true, actually. That has almost nothing to do with it. Nearly every miracle that Jesus performed was pushing back the effects of sin on our world. It was taking the effects of our sin and brokenness, and it was pushing them back to say, these will not rule anymore. My work is going to change things, right? He cured disease because sickness is a result of the fall of, of, our, of, of sin coming into the world. He fed the hungry because before we broke relationship with God, we were perfectly provided for, but now not so much. He restored the use of limbs, of hearing, and of sight because of the brokenness of our bodies reflects the brokenness of the world because of our sin. And he raised the dead. He raised the dead because death is a result of sin. He didn't come to give lessons. Jesus came to do battle. He came to disarm death. He came to remove its teeth and to take away its power. And he did that by taking our place. Death is a consequence for sin. And so Jesus went to the cross to deal with sin, to bear that for, our, for us in our place. It's there on the cross where he did battle with death. Because you see, death is only powerful so long as sin is still in the, in the game. The Apostle Paul talks about that in the New Testament. And so once he had taken the consequences of sin, death no longer had any power. So he rose up on the third day. Now, here's how this can come to bear in our lives as we escape our meaninglessness. You see, if Jesus simply rose from the dead, then yay for him. You know, lots of crazy things happen in the world. But if he came as a substitute, well, now there's something completely different. Because remember, we were made for dependence on God. So Jesus came so that we could return to depending on God. In Jesus, God came so that our faith would return to dependence on him. And what this means is that placing our faith in Jesus instead of our abilities will actually end the, the, the meaninglessness or the thing that causes meaninglessness in our lives. 
So not to be too morbid, but what are you going to do with death? Like, we don't like to talk about it in our culture, do we? We avoid it. We don't even call it death, do we? We call it passing away. Transitioning. I've heard it called that. Like, I've heard it called lots of different things. We don't call it death. Why? Because we want to pretend. We want to pretend that we don't have to think about it. But we do. Death ultimately makes all of our hopes fail. You can't escape meaninglessness on your own. Right? The problem is not circumstances. Such that if we just kind of change the circumstances, rearrange the deck chairs, right? Everything's going to be fine. If we work a little harder, things are going to be better. You and I can't clean ourselves up. And frankly, we cannot pretend that the problem is not that bad. Look, our problem is not that we're good enough, right? It's, it's, it's not that we're not good enough. It's that we're independent. It's that we're dead. And you can't fix dead with good. You have to be made alive by Jesus and to repent of all the ways that you've been seeking independence from him, whether that's in trying to be really moral to make God like you, and some of us in the room tend towards that, or whether that's been like, Trying to be really immoral because you assume that God hates you. Some of us are like that. Or, or whether it's just trying to pretend that you can decide what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, or whatever, instead of placing all your weight on Jesus. But he is the only hope for us. Last thing, okay? So we've used this phrase in this series, that when we take good things and make them ultimate They become meaningless, right? We've used that a lot. Take good things, things that are good, we make them ultimate, and then they become meaningless. We are tempted to think that we can take something down from that place of ultimacy in our hearts and just kind of leave it open. That is a lot like a fish saying, you know what? It's not that I'm, I'm not so fooled into thinking that I can breathe air, but what I'm not going to do is breathe water anymore. You weren't designed to have an open space. You will have something in that spot. The only escape from meaninglessness is through Jesus. He's the only escape. The only way to let everything else return to being good, whether that's money or sex or power or accomplishment or, 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 or relationships or, or youth or age, like the only way to let all of those things return to being good is to let Jesus return to being ultimate. None of those other things can deliver on their promises because death will still linger over them. Money can't stop it. Youth fades before it. Sex certainly can't keep it away. And control is like a joke to death. The only one who has ever fought against death and won, against meaninglessness and won, is Jesus. Return to him. He's the one what we're made for. Would you pray with me?